So let's start with just how you're doing. Uh, my family and I, we've, uh, we've been through a lot in the past nearly seven months now. Uh, every day we try to just find something positive to build off of, turn that into a positive, something positive for that week. Uh, through a lot of support, friends, family, other officers reaching out to us, uh, we're, we're hanging in there. Um, what is your reaction to the Civil Service Commission upholding uh, the city's decision to terminate you? I'm disappointed. Uh, <clears throat> not necessarily uh, uh, surprised by any means, um, but I'm disappointed more in the uh, the way that it appeared just just hours into the beginning of the hearing how it didn't appear that it was going to be an unbiased judgment from the commission members uh, from from my seat I could see a particular few of the commission members um, their body language the expressions on their face when certain things were answered by witnesses uh, what they agreed with and what they didn't already so you had a pretty good idea in the line of questioning. Yes. This wasn't going to go in your favor. Yes. yes. Is that a surprise to you? It was. Uh, it was. Uh, going into that hearing, uh, I had an understanding that this was supposed to be an unbiased uh, hearing, no matter how long it took. Uh, there would be a lot of things that would come out, and I wanted uh, an unbiased judgment based off of the things that would come out of that hearing. Do you feel like they were there questioning the shooting in general r rather than the policy violation that you were fired for? That's part of that that's probably the largest part of my disappointment in the hearing the the route that it was allowed to take. Uh, I was terminated for a policy violation uh, and it seemed as if a majority of what we talked about at that hearing uh, had to do with tactics uh, and other things that I was never found to be in violation of to begin with. Uh, I, I found it very concerning that uh, the Commission allowed uh, multiple witnesses to just second-guess tactics and other things that they believed could have been a violation when the uh, the chief of police, the man that terminated me, didn't find me in violation of those things. The scenarios that they were running through, what was going through your mind every time they brought up another scenario you could have done as they were as your lawyer has said um, second guessing your actions that day what was going through your mind when you saw them going doing all that uh, when it first began and they started bringing up the different scenarios the different tactics they believed I should have used um, my immediate thought went to something that you're told in the academy that uh, no matter what it is in law enforcement you have an absolute split second to react. You have a split second to decide what you're going to do, commit to it, and do it. Um, but now we're sitting here for two days second guessing when I had a, a millisecond to, to decide on what to do from, from the moment I pulled into the parking lot all the way until the end of the incident. Uh, I didn't agree with with them second guessing all of the tactics uh, surrounding that incident. Instead of just like I just said, instead of let's talk about what I was terminated for. Mm -hmm. You said during the hearing that your wife wasn't cleared medically to attend. Can you elaborate more and in, in what's going on? Yeah. Um, so I was terminated on May sixth. Uh, May 20th, uh, in our home I found my wife unresponsive, uh, severe convulsions, foaming at the mouth, uh, and her face was turning blue. Um, 
I called 911, and while the ambulance was en route, uh, all of a sudden she stopped convulsing uh, and stopped breathing. Uh, her, she began turning much darker of a blue through uh, medical training, through law enforcement and experiences I've had on the streets. Um, I realized what was taking place. She had no pulse. I began, I began CPR on my own wife in our home. Uh, shortly after, she began breathing again and within seconds went into more severe convulsions. Uh, about that time, the ambulance and the fire department showed up. Uh, she was in the hospital numerous days. Uh, from that incident, we went home with no answers. Uh, all summer, we had periodic testing. Um, about actually about a month, maybe about a month after that initial incident, uh, without losing her consciousness or breathing or, or her pulse, it happened again. And we were in the hospital again overnight and went home again with no answers. Uh, just recently, uh, just before this second round, our second hearing took place, uh, she was in the hospital for, uh, I believe it was five days, uh, undergoing some pretty intense testing. Uh, but out of that, we just recently, we, we've gotten a medical diagnosis finally. Uh, she's on the medication and uh, the neurologist says she's doing much, much better. Just another thing to add to what I know has been a long year for everyone, I guess, involved in, in this incident. Yes. Because I know, Robert, you had your uh, fall at, at City Hall, and, and how are you doing? Uh, well, besides my wrist hurting and most of the time wearing a protective uh, medical device on it, uh, all right, it's still painful. Uh, the doctor says the uh, metal plate will be in for about three months. Then they'll cut it out and take it out. They screwed my wrist back together. And, uh, it's a heck of a way to try to get a continuous. I was about to say. Um, okay, so what were you doing or what call were you at right before that call went out that ultimately sent you to that parking lot? Uh, I was actually uh, just off Bull Park Road, uh, monitoring traffic, uh, running license plates. Uh, we had had a recent string of uh, vehicles being broken into in that area, just being a, a presence. Uh, and a vehicle actually had just passed me. Um, and when I looked at the license plate, it, it was paper, but it was made out of construction paper. And the date on it was written with what looked like to be a Sharpie. So it was a homemade paper plate. Uh, I pulled out behind it, and before I could even do a traffic stop on it, it turned into a driveway. Um, at that time, as I got out of the car to tell them to stay in the car, because usually that means they're about to jump out and run, I realized that there were two young juveniles in the car. I uh, uh, approached the car and immediately uh, I can tell when I start talking to them and ask them, you know, what, what's going on, uh, the driver almost seemed hesitant to tell me something because his friend was next to him. Um, so I asked him if, if he could just step out to separate that so we can just have a conversation. Um, and immediately at the back of the car he started to break down and uh, he explained to me that uh, he worked two jobs. He supported his mother and his siblings. Uh, he had just recently saved up the money to get that car. Uh, he had paper tags for it, but they had expired just a few days prior to that. And so he made that just hoping that it would get by. Um, I had to talk with him about, you know, what, what could happen due to those kinds of things. And that if he would just if he were to get pulled over with that expired paper tag uh, and he would just be open and honest the way he was with me, chances are he officers would have compassion with him and understand uh, that he was just trying to do the right thing. Uh, so short conversation, uh, had him get back in the car uh, and uh, just before I left, I asked him to put the paper tag, the original paper tags back on the vehicle. He did that, I drove away. 
uh, about that time, yeah, and then uh, just as I was coming to the stop sign at Bull Park, a detective keyed up asking for any units in the area of 12th and University. Okay, and I know that um, that's when everything changed that day. Um, I can imagine that the shooting takes up a lot of thoughts. How often do you think about the shooting? In the past seven months, there hasn't been a, a minute that's gone by that that hasn't been in the front of my mind. Um, children's birthday parties, family gatherings, hanging out with friends, uh, being with my wife, it's always there. When you think about it, what do you think about? I see the stare that I was given when I got out of the vehicle asking to see his hands. Um, through the training we had received, I knew there was something off at that point. Uh, but more than anything, that's what's stuck in my mind is just the look on his face, uh, staring forward. Uh, what, what we refer to in law enforcement as a thousand yard stare. And, and that image just doesn't go away. Try and run different scenarios through your mind where you're almost second guessing, like what if I would have done this? Or what if I would have done that? Do you run through scenarios in your mind? Not necessarily what would I, if I had done something, if everything on his side had continued the way it happened, um, but more so in comparing it to arrests I'd made before on uh, people that were in possession of stolen cars. Uh, I've arrested numerous people in, in that situation and I can't think of one that I ever even had a use of force with. Um, I replay through my mind all the time, what would life be like not just for my family, for his family, at this point, had he just complied, gotten out of the car like I asked him to, he would have been put in handcuffs and it would have been over with. There are people that have uh, put out on social media and, and just all over that I had this ulterior motive and that's, that's just not the case. It was brought up in documents during the hearing that you blacked out during the shooting. And I think that we heard that is being called, is that similar to tunnel vision? I think if, if somebody read the actual sentence that it's in, he said, you know, he couldn't remember, he doesn't know if he blacked out or his mind just didn't remember it. And uh, as I brought up at the hearing and some of the officers did, there's well documented in the scientific community that when the body uh, and mind has gone through a highly stressful situation, that there's a, a period of time, sometimes it doesn't ever come back, your mind just doesn't remember it. it it's uh, not a blackout in the sense of fainting. It's just your, your mind doesn't do it and it's been documented by the FBI, Behavioral Science, the National Police Chiefs Association. Well, what, what would you say, Robert? I mean, we, we heard tunnel vision most of that second afternoon, those words. A lot of the people in the hearing, they didn't like that. What would be your response to those people? Have they ever faced the worry that they weren't going to go home and see their wife, see their two-year-old child, uh, be faced with the proposition of being killed and having to take somebody, have to take somebody else's life. I've done these shootings for 30 some odd years uh, and I haven't found a policeman yet that has, oh great, it was wonderful. Uh, uh, I give uh, credit to a lawyer from Atlanta that does in Georgia a lot of police representations and he had a client that had been involved in a, a shooting, uh, taking life. 
and the guy talked about the same thing, the mental am and Lance said to him, why is it bothering you so much? It was a good shooting. Uh, you spent two or three tours with special forces in the desert. You know, this isn't the first person you've had to kill. And he said, I got up over there, put on my boots, and went out the door knowing my job that day was to kill the enemy. I don't get up and put on my uniform and go out on the streets of Atlanta expecting that I'm going to have to kill somebody. And the tunnel vision is just the natural body's uh, flight or fight uh, reaction from the scientific literature I've read. Uh, they might not have liked tunnel vision, but it's something that's not unknown in the literature. Charles, do you remember your first thought after you pulled the trigger? Or is that still fuzzy? It's, it's still fuzzy. Um, I know that the second time I was bumped, when I felt the pain in my leg and I pulled the trigger, uh, I was still in great fear of being shot. I was being hit by the car and I was still concerned with a gun coming up from him. Uh, so while this is taking place, still in my mind, I'm trying to get to my cover. Uh, other, as far as uh, emotion or anything like that, I, 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 can't, I can't say. Um, do you feel like you did anything wrong that day? Do I, do I feel like I did anything wrong? Yeah. No. Uh, do I have an incredible amount of guilt? Uh, I have guilt that what I did uh, caused five children to not know their father growing up. Um, but had I not done what I'd done, my child would have never known me growing up. Um, what I did uh, was an absolute reaction to Mr. Blackshire's actions um, to ensure that I, at the end of that day I went home to my family. The Blackshire family has said that your actions that day are destructive. What would be your response to that? I would say two things to that. Um, my actions that day were based off of the non-compliance of the lawful orders I gave to Mr. Blackshire to just get out of the car so I could place him under arrest. Uh, they were based off of uh, my desire to go home at the end of my shift, um, labeling them destructive by the, by the meaning of that word. Uh, I, I took someone's life. Uh, that has destroyed their family, and understandably so. So while I may disagree with them labeling it as that, I, I understand why they would say that. Robert, I don't know if this is something that you want to answer or if Charles can answer it. Um, the IA investigator, Sergeant Stevens, yes. testified that everyone felt pressured to complete the investigation not only the criminal investigation in 13 days, but to have the IA file completed in 24 hours. Chief Buley testified that he authorized all the manpower. Chief Buley testified that he authorized the overtime. What is your guys' reaction to that testimony? Well, there's a memo to the file, in the criminal file, from uh, Officer Onkin, Detective Onkin, who was one of the primary investigators, uh, that uh, he was told by Lieutenant Allen, Sidney Allen, who was the lieutenant over major crimes at that time, 
that they had to get it done by such and such a date, even though Ankin basically, and I'm paraphrasing, the file would be open under the FOI, it's in the criminal file, that, hey, look, I want more time. Uh, I know that the police department, in a conversation uh, I had with one of the investigators when they were trying to get Charles set up for an interview, you know, that, hey, we're really getting pressure to get this done. Uh, can you come in? I, he'd been in the hospital, had been damaged. So uh, I think the, it's a small thing. You don't know what else may have been out there uh, that wasn't preserved, wasn't done. But as uh, Chief uh, Fink said, traditionally you would have had measurements. You would have had accident reconstruction. Uh, if you look at the video, it, you, you would have, and they had done measurements, you would have seen that uh, Charles had backed up almost the whole width of a parking space where they're trying to act like, well, you know, he was right next to the car, never took any action and moved back. I mean, that's a, one thing. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what else, but it's uh, anybody that claims it wasn't rushed or there wasn't pressure, uh, I just disagree with Chief Bewley. I, I was there from the day one, and I know what I was told by people I trust and believe. The entire chain of command voted to reinstate Starks, um, except for the police chief. Why do you think that is? I know the police chief denies it. Uh, I don't have anything I can put. You know, here it is in black and white. Here's the tweet. Here's the email. But. I know Chief uh, Finks said that in his interview, he didn't testify to this at the th hearing. He told me about it, asked me to keep it confidential, and then later did uh, re release it to the press. That one of the first questions he was asked by the mayor was who would be the first person you would fire if you're made chief. It's hard for me to believe that he would ask the person he didn't hire who told him, I can't tell you, I don't know. I mean, that's my memory of what Chief thinks that he said. Didn't ask or somehow intimate or in, uh, to uh, Chief Humphrey, this is something that I want to be done. I've done this since 1979. I think I've gone through five or six police chiefs, maybe seven. This is the first time I've seen inside chiefs, outside chiefs. I have never seen anybody else totally disregard the recommendations of the chain of command. Now, they may have differed with it and said, all right, you think he should get 20 days, I'm going to give him 30 days. But we had the entire chain of command say he didn't violate any policy. And these aren't people that are inexperienced, uh, novice police officers. Um, so I, I think that there was, it was political. Is there anything that you want to say to fellow officers? First, um, the incredible, incredible amount of uh, concern, support, uh, the phone calls, the texts, the messages, the letters, the cards, everything um, that my wife, my family, and I have received. Um, it hasn't been unnoticed. We, we are incredibly appreciative of the support. Um, secondly, I, I just want to tell them, don't give up. Uh, don't let this be a reason that you consider not doing the job you love. Uh, every man and woman at that department gets up, kisses their family goodbye, knowing that they might not come back. And they do that out of something that's deep within them, a desire to just make a difference and help people. Um, I don't want outside things, my case, 
other political things that are going on to have any influence on them changing their life's path uh, or their life's desire to just make a difference and help people. Uh, just keep, keep doing what you're doing and uh, good, good always prevails in the end. So you guys are appealing to circuit court. Do you think that you can be a police officer in the city of Little Rock again? And do you think you can do the job efficiently if circuit court reverses the city's decision? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think that um, just as I just said, uh, my, my desire was to make a difference in this community, to help people. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that if a judge sees this the way it should be done and overturns it, reinstating me, that I can play a vital role in not only making a difference in this community, but if allowed, helping this community heal. I, I, I truly believe that I, I can step up to, to that and, and help make a difference in this city. Is that what you would tell people who you'd have to convince? I mean, if you civil service didn't think for for whatever reason that you shouldn't have your job back, you know, the police chief thinks that. Um, is that what you would tell them in, in hopes that you can convince them to change their mind? That I can help this community heal? Uh, I would tell them that the the basis of my termination was in was not correct. I, I should not have been terminated. Uh, that's what, as, as the entire chain of command and numerous other witnesses testified to, I never should have been found in violation of that policy, much less terminated for it. Uh, that's what should overturn my firing. Uh, but I have no qualms about telling them when my termination is overturned, that I would, I would absolutely love to be involved in, in, in helping this community on both sides, even, even the officers when involved in high stress situations, uh, helping them recover from that. Uh, not, not physically, but psychologically, it is, it is absolutely horrible what you go through on the other side of that shooting. Um, I'm not trying to take away from what their family's going through. I understand it, uh, but the officer involved, uh, they don't get to speak out. They don't get to say anything publicly. Uh, your attorneys do great job, do a great job, but you're silenced for months. And the nights that you wake up at two, three in the morning, your spouse is asleep, your child's asleep, your mind's absolutely racing, and you're sweating like crazy with all these thoughts going through your head. What do you do? You know, what do you turn to? What do you do? And there's no doubt in my mind that if reinstated, when officers go through situations that, that I could assist in, in helping with that process for those officers. What, what do you do at two or three in the morning? A, a lot of prayer. Um, I've been seen walking through my neighborhood a lot at three o'clock in the morning. Um, just looking up, questioning why. Um, and, it, and it's not necessarily that you go to bed with an easier feeling, but it helps to just vocalize things, even if it is to yourself, God. Um, it, it just get up, walk around, uh, uh, express your frustrations. Obviously, at three in the morning, you can't go outside and just scream. Um, but but I've found that that. Getting up, walking, uh, I've, there's been numerous nights that I've gone in the backyard uh, and we have a fire pit in our backyard. 
I lit a small fire and just sat out there and looked at the stars and, and talked to God. What do you think that there's anything that you could say to the Blackshires family? Do you think there's anything that you can say to the Blackshire family that would change their hearts about you? No. Why not? Why not? I haven't spoken on this once since this incident happened and uh, only people that know me at my core, the closest to my family and me know this. Um, when I was 11, 11 years old, uh, my father was murdered by gunfire. Uh, the man that shot him never went to jail and is still living life as he wants today. Um, <clears throat> I'm a God-fearing man, but to this day, I've never forgiven that man. Have you tried? Yes, and, and I've never come to terms with that. Uh, I, was, I was very blessed in the fact that I had uh, my stepdad, who I've always considered dad as well. Uh, I was blessed to have him in my life at that point. So I still had a father figure growing up. What the Blackshires are going through, they're never, their hearts are hurting. Those children are hurting. And while I'm hopeful that eventually someday that could happen, that the forgiveness could happen, uh, the, the hurt in their heart would go away through personal experience, uh, my father was taken when I was 11 years old. That was 21 years ago, coming up on 21 years ago. And that's not gone away. So uh, there's nothing I can say that is going to change the pain in their heart. Does that scare you? It does. It truly does. How do you move forward? Obviously, you're appealing to circuit court, but on a, on a deeper level, mentally, psychologically, how, how does someone who's in your position move forward? Have you, have you figured that out yet? Not necessarily move forward in a sense of saying, I'm okay. Uh, I, I took someone's life, I'll, I'll never be okay. If, if that makes any sense, but coming to terms with it, coming to terms with what I had to do to, to be at home with my family. Um, on those hard days, I, I have to find a way to cope with what I'm going through psychologically in a positive manner. Uh, you see it all over the country that uh, there are officers uh, and, and veterans that, that don't cope with what they see, what they go through, and what they experience in a positive way. And that leads down a path that I, I don't want to be on. Uh, so reach out. I, I've, I've spoken with family members in the middle of the day just when I'm having a hard time. Uh, there have been days that unannounced, I've shown up at the FOP Lodge hoping that there would be someone there that I can just talk to. Uh, that's happened. Um, I've, I've found great joy in, in, in stress relief via running again. Haven't done that in years. Uh, but, but you have to find a positive way to uh, you have to find a positive way to start wrapping your head around things uh, without it, instead of, instead of a destructive way. It's one of the things that 
Little Rock does do, and I'll give them credit, and it wasn't started under this mayor or this police chief, but a number of years ago, is that uh, if you're an employee, uh, initially, and, and Charles was, was you know, sent to EAP, and EAP works with them uh, and says whether they're ready to go back to work, and Charles was cleared to go back to work. But that's available, and it, it's, it's one of the things that uh, you know, Little Rock does do that helps the officer, uh, you know, when he, if he really gets down, that it's not, they can go without any stigma. Uh, the other thing I, I, that you're talking about circuit court, I think it's important. You mentioned the chain of command uh, clearing him. The commission wouldn't let me put it on, but uh, Sergeant Stevens, who was the IA investigator, when I talked to him, he said, I do not think he should have been fired. Uh, Assistant Chief Folk, uh, if you remember, I don't know if you were there during her testimony, and while she thought there was a technical violation of the policy, they wouldn't let her with 25 years, I think she has, uh, she said, I wouldn't have fired him. I don't think he should have been fired. And, and the sergeant had just retired with 38. So it's, it's not even those that within the department that thought there was a you know, violation. Uh, there wasn't anybody other than the chief that thought he should be fired. Uh, and even one of the chairman of the commission voted no on the punishment. I don't know if um, I have a couple questions about LRPD. I don't know, um, and feel free to step in if, if you'd like. Do you feel, we, we, you, in the Civil Service Commission, there was a lot of conversation about training, approaching a car from the front. <clears throat> Do you feel, and again, feel free to step in, do you feel that LRPD failed you when it comes to training, when it comes to approaching a car from the front? I, I, the Blackshires have sued claiming that there was not adequate training, so I'd rather Charles not answer that. Okay. I will answer it is there can always be more training. It's you know, what is foreseeable, what is done. LRPD, I'm not exactly certain of this, but they do probably about four or five more weeks of training than the Arkansas State uh, Law Enforcement Academy does. And as I think several witnesses from training said, there's not enough time to train on every scenario and that's why the U.S. Supreme Court has said in deadly force things, it's, you don't quarterback it. You don't judge it from the comfort of a judge's chair. You judge it from what would a reasonable police officer do at that moment with no time to sit there and contemplate all kinds of permutations of an event. So, yeah, it'd be lovely if they had five years worth of training before they went on the street, but the city even chose to cut down on the budget this year for training on the number of bullets that they had for practice. Mm, okay. Um, is there anything else that you want to say or bring up that I haven't touched on? I just want to. I just want to let people know that. Uh, there have been a, a lot of things said about me, about my character, about who I am as a person um, that are very, while I understand they're frustrated, they're angry, and they're hurt, it's, it's not true. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and uh, at the, at the core of who I am, I care about helping people. This is something that happened on a day that I chose to go to work when I had a doctor's note to be off all week. I had the flu. My guys at work were shorthanded. I knew they were shorthanded. And it was more important for me to go to work and try to make 
a difference in someone's life to help someone than to stay at home. Uh, it's absolutely tragic what happened. It is. But this monster that I, I was painted out to be after this incident happened, that's, that's not me. That's not who I am. Do you think you'll ever be able to change people's view? There are a select few that I've, through conversation with, that I've spoken with, uh, that have kind of wrapped their heads around what truly happened that day, that, uh, that have become more open uh, to seeing the person that I really am. Uh, but as far as, it goes back to what I, what I said about changing the hearts of, of, of Mr. Blackshire's family, it's, it's not that they can't, it's that it, more than likely it won't. Uh, and, and like I said, I, I'm not bitter because of that. Uh, I've been through it, I understand, and, and I don't expect it. I think one of the things that on people accepting it, and I've had people, obviously I've been identified as Charles's lawyer, you know, wish me good luck, and, and some of them, I, you know, wait, 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 why couldn't you have done this? And when they look at the decision time he had, uh, they start realizing it, and then what I'd like a lot of people to think of, this wasn't a one-sided decision tree. Uh, Mr. Blackshire, uh, you know, chose that day uh, to drive a stolen car, even if he didn't know it was a stolen car, as his family claims. He knew that it was illegal for him to have a stolen 45 automatic in the car with 13 grams of meth. And he knew that all he had to do was get out of the car and it would have been over with. And well, he wouldn't have been over with because he would have had numerous felony charges. But he decided instead that he was going to run over Mr. Starks if he didn't get out of the way fast enough. So there was decisions made by Mr. Blackshire that unfortunately the consequences were terrible for everybody.